This is a production by One and All Media. For more, head to oneandall.media. There are many who are listening to this message who are wrestling with God and have been their entire lives. This isn't just for those who've experienced trauma. This is for everybody because most of us truly believed that we have been wrestling all of our lives with our arch enemy and somehow this thing, this person, this situation is the thing that has stood in the way of us being everything that God meant us to be. And we believe that if we can truly face this enemy and defeat it, whatever it is, if we can annihilate the problem in our lives, if we could just remove the barrier, then everything's fine. Today. 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 Today with Jeff Fines, pastor, apologist, and Bible teacher. Welcome to Today with Jeff Fines. My name's Aaron. This week, Pastor Jeff is revisiting older messages in his Reset series. You can find all the messages wherever you listen to podcasts. Just search for Today with Jeff Vines. Today's message is about resetting our connection with others, but more importantly, our connection with God. Let's begin with Pastor Jeff. Those of you who know me know that I have three brothers. Uh, I am the second of four children given by God to my parents. My older brother was built more like my father, while the other three were built more like my mom. He was a Tennessee state championship wrestler. And he would come home and practice his moves, whether it be the pretzel hold or the half Nelson, on me because I was the one in close proximity. And I don't know how many times he would get me all tied up and I'd have nowhere to go. And then inevitably, he would look at me and say words that a younger brother hates hearing. If you stop wrestling, if you stop struggling, I'll let you go. But you don't want to do that because by doing that means that you're giving up. It means that you're admitting that you're not really in control. And that's just hard to do. Now, let me just say straight up here. There are many who are listening to this message all around the world who are wrestling with God and have been their entire lives. All along, you've believed that your problem was your brother or your sister or your mom or your dad or the family in which you were raised or a coach or a teacher or a boss or a lover or a spouse or maybe some event that occurred in your life you truly believe ruined your life. You've always believed that if they or this or that had not existed, that you would get all of those things that you feel you're entitled to. Now, this isn't just for those who've experienced trauma. This is for everybody. Because most of us truly believed that we have been wrestling all of our lives with our arch enemy, and somehow this thing, this person, this situation is the thing that has stood in the way of us being everything that God meant us to be, and achieving everything we were meant to achieve. And we believe that if we can truly face this enemy and defeat it, whatever it is, if we can annihilate the problem in our lives, if we could just remove the barrier, then everything's fine. I want to give you an opportunity this weekend to have a good look at that belief system and to open your eyes to what the real problem in our lives really is. And then to push the reset button and start again. And there is perhaps no better example of this very thing in anywhere in Scripture than in the life of Jacob in the Old Testament. So Jacob, in Genesis chapter 32, comes to a climactic point in his life. And let me read. This is how it goes. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overcome him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. This is the point in Jacob's life where he recognizes what his real problem is and that he's been wrong all of his life 
and he's going to push the reset button and it will change his basic fundamental strategy concerning the way he's going to live his life. Now to understand the context, what's happening here in Jacob in this situation, you have to really understand that Jacob's story started with his grandfather Abraham. You know Jacob, so grandfather Abraham, father Isaac, and then Jacob comes along. The story begins really when, when God comes to Abraham and says, I'm going to bless your descendants. They're going to be as numerous as the sand in the sea and the stars in the sky. I'm going to progress your name. I'm going to increase your possessions. I'm going to expand and prosper everything around you. But you have to leave the home you presently dwell in and go to a land or a country I will show you. And so Abraham obeys God, does exactly that. He's waiting for 20 years for this promise to come true. He still doesn't have an heir. And it's very difficult to have thousands of descendants if you don't yet have one. Sarah, his wife, is getting older by the day. And Abraham comes to a, a, a junction in his life where he decides that he's actually going to take matters into his own hands. He actually sleeps with his concubine, Hagar. He wants to help God along a little bit. He says, God made me a promise that my descendants would multiply exponentially, but I don't have an heir. Sarah, my wife, is barren, so I'll just take matters into my own hands so that I can help God give me the blessing that he promised me all along. God rebukes Abraham, and according to his promise, eventually does give Abraham and Sarah a son in their old age. His name is Isaac. Now, Isaac becomes the son of promise through whom the Messiah will come. Isaac grows up, he becomes a man, marries Rebekah. God reminds Isaac, you are the son of promise, and now you are going to bear a son, and he's going to become the son of promise. Isaac's wife, Rebekah, bears twins, Jacob and Esau. Esau emerges first from the womb, which means he's the firstborn son, and Jacob grabbing hold of Esau's heel and attempts, metaphorically, I guess, to pull him back into the womb so that he can be the firstborn. And then God comes to Isaac and actually says something that would have greatly disturbed Isaac. He said, the older is going to actually serve the younger. The reason that's a big problem is Esau, Jacob, Isaac, just as Abraham before them, lived in a culture of primogeniture. Primogeniture is where the firstborn gets everything. They did not divide their land equally among the offspring. They believed in the principle that we still enunciate today, that it takes money to make money. So they would give all their money, all their resources to the firstborn so that he would have the money to make money, expand the family name, expand the property and land and possessions. Now, the problem is that the Bible tells us that Esau was favored by Isaac. Esau was a kind of an outdoor man. He loved to hunt and gather. And evidently, Isaac was the same way. While Jacob, on the other hand, uh, was experienced in culinary delights. He was like his mother. He liked to remain in the tent. He liked to cook and prepare meals. So Esau is loved by his father Isaac He's a hunter-gatherer. He drives a four-by-four, four, uh, listening to country music with a rifle in the back and deer hide in the front. He's a man's man. So Isaac takes a look at Esau and naturally thinks that he should be the firstborn, that he should be the one who receives rather the firstborn blessings. God comes along and says, no, I've decided it will be Jacob, which will be against every cultural norm of which Isaac will be familiar so from the very beginning, Isaac doesn't like the choice that God has made. So he ignores it. He repeats the sin of his father, Abraham. Instead of trusting in the promises of God, he takes things into his own hands. Even though Isaac was clearly told that Jacob would be the one, he hides behind cultural practices, blocks it out of his mind to the degree that when Isaac is old and it's time for the firstborn blessing, he actually sins for Esau rather than Jacob in direct disobedience to what God had told him about his two sons. Ah, but Rebekah, Isaac's wife, devises a plan with the help of Jacob. 
And I got to tell you, uh, many of you will be familiar with the story. And as I read the story this week, I started to look at Rebecca differently because in the beginning I thought, why would Rebecca go against the wishes and desires of Isaac, the patriarch, the father? And then I, I started thinking, it could be because like many wives, she was trying to prevent her husband from doing something stupid. She wouldn't be the first and she's definitely not going to be the last. And so she concocts a plan to deceive Isaac. Isaac is older. Uh, his, his sight is, uh, is waning. Uh, he doesn't have the, the senses that he had when he was a younger man. And so Rebecca puts goat hair on the arms of Jacob and his shoulders and makes him smell like the outdoors because the Bible tells us that Esau was hairy and that he was a hunter-gatherer. Jacob goes into the tent. Isaac thinks it's Esau by touch and smell and gives Isaac. Jacob, the firstborn blessing. Now, the other problem in this scenario is Jacob believes that he has the right to the firstborn blessing because he's heard the prophecy. So in his mind, Esau is his enemy and is standing in the way of everything he's entitled to because of the blessing, because of the prophecy. So in his mind, again, Esau is his enemy. And Jacob constantly tries to undermine Esau wrestle with Esau, strive against Esau to take possession of what he thinks is rightfully his. In fact, there's a story in the Old Testament where Esau's been out hunting and gathering for days and he's famished, he's eaten, he's not eaten rather, uh, how many days we don't know. He comes in off out of the wilderness and Jacob is there and he's made a beautiful bowl of beef stew and Jacob says to Esau, would you like something to eat knowing that Esau is near death, Esau says, yes, please. And Jacob says, well, give me your birthright and I'll give you the stew. And of course, Esau thinks, well, what good is a birthright if I'm dead? So he takes the, the, the stew and Jacob thinks that somehow he's manipulated the situation and the firstborn blessing will come to him sooner. In his mind, all of his life, Esau is his enemy. Together with his mother then, they go in and deceive Isaac just as Abraham, his grandfather, had taken matters into his own hands. Jacob ends up doing the same thing. Now, I cannot emphasize to you enough, if we're going to really understand this principle, how Jacob grew up despising Esau, resenting Esau, playing over and over again in his mind was, if I want to get what God has promised me, I'm going to have to wrestle for it. I'm going to have to wrestle it away from Esau. I'm the one. I got to get what's rightfully mine. So, Ironically, after the deed is done, Jacob deceives Isaac. Esau comes into the tent expecting to receive the firstborn blessing. And of course, the first thing Isaac thinks is, well, who did I, who did I just bless? Esau becomes furious when he learns that his father Isaac has given the firstborn blessing to Jacob because Jacob, with the help of Rebekah, they have deceived him. The problem again with Esau is he sees all this as superstition because he looks to his father and says, well, what difference does it make that you bless Jacob? Just bless me now. Say the magic words. That's all that really matters. And the Bible tells us at that moment, Isaac, the father, begins to tremble. And he's not trembling because he's angry. He's trembling because his eyes have been opened. Suddenly he realizes he's not been fighting against Jacob. He's been fighting against God. In one fell swoop, Isaac realizes that God is communicating something to him. Isaac, you've been fighting me and my sovereign choice, but my sovereign choice will be upheld even if you try to circumvent the process. So Isaac is trembling because he's repenting. And Isaac hears his son Esau, his favorite son, say, Father, what does it matter? Bless me. And Isaac says, I'm sorry, son. I have blessed your brother Jacob. And yes, indeed, he will be blessed. It is the sovereign choice of God. So Jacob succeeds, but he has no real practical outcome in his life. He's still depressed. He's still despondent. He's still struggling. He's still wrestling. Nothing really changes because he truly believes that his real problem is Esau and that Esau stands in the way between Jacob and his ultimate destiny, his hope and his future. Jacob says in his mind, I, I am the one, I am the leader, I am the messianic child, the chosen one. This is my destiny, and I've got to help God give it to me. Now, you think about how ridiculous that is. 
So part of the wrestling means that because Jacob took matters into his own hands, his life is disintegrating. He runs away from the very land he's wanting to inherit because his brother Esau is trying to kill him. He leaves his father with a broken heart, his mother, the only woman who's ever really loved him. He leaves his people. He's now estranged from his people, restricted from his land and culture and family. And I'm sure in his mind, he's thinking, you know, if I'm winning this wrestling match, why does it feel that my shoulders are on the mat and someone's counting to 10? Now, as he's running away, God meets him in the desert. And you'll remember the story called Jacob's Ladder. And in Jacob's Ladder, God appears to Jacob from above seeking relationship. God is trying to communicate to Jacob, your life is not about this promise. Your life is about me. And in the same way that Abraham and Isaac came to know me, Jacob, the pursuit of your life is not this firstborn blessing. The pursuit of your life is me. But do you know what Jacob does when he meets God? He has the audacity to say this to God. He says, well, God, if you will be with me and give me food and protection, and if you will help me finally get home to my land and my people safely, then I will make you the Lord my God. Wow. Really? He says, God, if you will do what I want in the way that I want it, then I will make you the Lord my God. I will serve you. Now, there's another irony here. One of my favorite books, one of my favorite authors is an author by the name of Philip Yancey. And he writes a book, he's written a numerous books, prolific writer, but he's written a book called Rumors of Another World. And he describes climbing the mountain behind his home in Colorado. He says he loves climbing mountains. And part of the reason he loves to climb these mountains is because as he sets out on the journey to tackle this mountain that is very close to his home, he says, when you climb mountains, it presents a continual shifting point of view. He says, when I first start to climb, there is this sheer wall of granite that are thousands of feet high. But as I get closer, what I thought to be a wall that is impenetrable, now suddenly a thin path emerges, following the seams around to make the climb rather easy. It's a comfortable journey through and around what previously seemed insurmountable. He says, then as the path zigs and zags, the, the view changes below. First, I see the beautiful aspen trees. And then on the other side, as I make my way around the mountain, I see that the aspens actually circle an alpine lake. And then I see that the lake and forest nestle into a, a lush valley dotted with lakes and meadows and other groves of trees. And then later on in that same valley, I see that it fits into a cut on the side of the mountain. And then as I climb higher and higher, I see that there are streams of water spilling from its lakes, tumbling down several thousand feet to feed a river that runs through a canyon near my home, 20 miles away. And then he finishes that segment by saying this, only when I reach the summit does the entire landscape fit together. Until then, any conclusion I might draw would prove mistaken. Do you understand the illustration? The events that come into your life are clouded by the reality that you have not yet reached the pinnacle. You have no idea how the events in your life, good or bad, are related to the ultimate goal and calling on your life. The real issue, if we're honest, is we don't trust God. We don't trust that the pinnacle exists. We don't trust that these roads lead in our lives to anything of value. We don't trust that there is a vantage point ahead that will show us how God has used all the events in our lives to get us to the most captivating scene of our lives. What Jacob is saying is, God... I don't know why my life is going like this. I'm the one. I'm supposed to inherit the land, but everything's going wrong. Now, never mind that Jacob is reaping what he's sowing. That's another sermon completely. This is something I will never understand in all my years of ministry. I don't understand it in others, and I rarely understand it in myself. Just one example, I, I knew a woman who married a man against the direct advice of her spirit-led father. 
Her father said to her, if you marry this man, you will not be able to pursue the things you want to pursue. You want to be involved in ministry. If you marry this man, your life will not be involved in ministry. You've wanted to be the wife of a, of a preacher of the good news of the gospel. If you marry this man, that's not what your life is going to end up being like. And she goes against the advice of a father. The husband that she marries becomes distant rather quickly and consumed with money. She then becomes an enabler of her own children's behavior because they're rebelling because of an absent father who should have loved them. She tries desperately, as best she knows how, to hold the family together and to maintain the illusion of unity. I say illusion because she did not want her father to have the last word. She wanted to prove her father wrong. So she maintains this illusion, this deception. But ultimately, everything catches up to her. Her kids leave God, become atheists. Her husband leaves her and she leaves God. And the reason she leaves God for a season is because in her mind, God did not deliver. How we forget that the blessings of God are tied to the precepts of God, that there is life in the law. In Jacob's case, he looks at the issues of his life and he says, there's no way these problems can be part of my future. And he says to God, when are you going to straighten all this out and fix my life? When are you going to sovereignly intervene and make my life go the way it's supposed to be going? God, I will serve you, but you got to help me first. You got, you got me into this mess. You gave me this father. You gave me this mother. You gave me this brother. Now fix it. And Jacob continues his journey. And after meeting God and responding very poorly, I might add, he goes off to live in another land and to show you the grace and mercy of God, God prospers him anyway. And now he returns to his land. He's going to go back home now in hopes. Years have passed of getting his land back and his family. But Jacob is a chronic wrestler. There's nothing about him that trusts the provision and the sovereign God. You know, I remember growing up in Tennessee and... Uh, I hated working in the gardens in the summer. My three brothers and I, we had to work in the garden because it's the way we survived. We got our food from what we had planted. But I hated to work in the hot summer, you know, 90 degrees with 90% humidity. And inevitably, my father would walk over to, over to me as I was seated on the front porch drinking iced tea, and he would say, son, we can either do this the easy way or the hard way, but make no mistake, you're going to be working in the garden today. You kind of feel like God is saying this to Jacob. And I think he says it to us. We can do this the easy way or the hard way, but I have promised you something and I will deliver one way or the other. And so Jacob begins his journey home. He's ready to wrestle some more. He's a chronic wrestler. It's like high noon at the OK Corral. Esau's the only thing standing between Jacob and the things he feels he's entitled to. There's going to be a showdown in the desert. Jacob says to himself, if I want my people, my family, and the land, I got to go face the one person who's been the main problem all my life. I've got to appease, flatter, or at least defang Esau, but I got to do something. You've been listening to Today with Jeff Fines. Thanks for joining us. Next time, we'll bring you the rest of this message from Pastor Jeff. Can you just admit for just a moment that your real problem is you don't trust God? Can you just be honest and admit that the biggest mistake you've made is in trying to manipulate, control, and calculate the manner in which you could force your life to turn out the way that you want it to turn out. And God, because he has not played his part and done what you think he should have done when he you should have done it. You can listen to more messages like it, this. Just search for Today him. with Jeff so Fines wherever your own you listen to podcasts. Today. 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 Today with Jeff Vines. This is a production by One and All Media. For more, head to oneandall.media.